Hello, everybody, to this uh, webinar. Firstly, uh, before we have uh, three presentations from our guest, I would like to floor, give the floor to uh, Consul General Herbert Kunst, who will open and provide some introductions. Thank you very much, Walter. Welcome to all participants and our speakers at this webinar on the COVID crisis and its consequences on business and international trade. Today, we will focus on support measures on state level for small businesses on the US West Coast. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers. Max Oldersdorf, the Deputy Director at the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Jan Joosten from law firm Baker McKenzie, supported by his colleague, Matt. Arjen de Raaf, founder of the local startup Idenry. And of course you, Walter, my colleague, for a brief overview of the support measures taken beyond the state of California. But first and foremost, I would like to share with you that these are challenging and unprecedented times for everyone. For a few weeks now, all of our daily lives have been affected in ways we couldn't have imagined. Because of COVID-19, you are working from home and cannot see your family or friends or a relative who is ill. And all of your daily routines have been affected and it's just difficult to adjust to the new normal. And I want to assure you that our consular team at the consulate is ready to assist you. And our consular services will continue to be provided through our consular colleagues and the 24 seven contact center of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And if you're a Dutch citizen, I just want to say, please register with the ministry so we can reach out to you whenever there's a need to. And of course, businesses have been affected as well. And with the economic uncertainty that lies ahead of us, we, the consulate in San Francisco, will continue to providing support and help Dutch companies here at the West Coast. We will help US companies that want to relocate to the Netherlands. And of course, we are committed to promoting US-Netherlands trade. And like many other organizations, we also had to adjust our service model so that we can continue to support all of you. And to this end, we've launched our e-consulate San Francisco, and we will continue to offer all our services in a digital environment to you. So personal meetings will take place through video conferences, and events are reconceived as part of an encompassing webinar series starting today. We've set up an online Holland in the Valley platform where mentors will coach selected Dutch startups, and we are creating a digital Founders Academy with an online curriculum. And we're even working on virtual trade missions to Silicon Valley and digital fact-finding trips to the Netherlands. And please ask us about trade and business-related questions. You can now easily connect to us and help us to connect us through WhatsApp. In short, I would like to say the Netherlands consulate will remain open for business to help you. Please, Walter, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Herbert. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, the webinar and, and first and foremost, I would like to give the floor to Max Oltersdorf from, the, uh, from GOBIS. Um, he's Deputy Director uh, for International Affairs and Trade at the California Governor's Office. He will talk about uh, the marriages taken by California. Afterwards, I will uh, provide some words about, about uh, the city measures and uh, some other states in our region. I would also like to uh, ask all participants, if you have a question, please use the Q&A tool on the bottom of the Zoom uh, window. And if you like a question uh, previously asked by somebody, you can also vote on it and to give it more weight during the, uh, during the session and then we know uh, which questions we should surely focus on. Questions we, we, we cannot answer today, we will answer later on. And, uh, and at the end, there will be a WhatsApp number open as well, uh, shown on the screen, which you can uh, use for today, but also from now on for any questions you might have on business, but also consular services. So uh, I would like to give the floor now to Max, and uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, I'd like to provide an update on international business in California and what we're doing at the state level to try to mitigate some of the impact. Um, first of all, it's important to note that according to our ports, uh, as the economies on the other side of the Pacific get back up to capacity, additional ships will be sailing to California. 
Uh, for Dutch exporters in California, this means more containers available for shipping and more ships leaving port. And the high level message here is that our supply chain remains open through the shelter in place. So if there are goods that need to be moved, uh, California has the capacity to move them. Our border with Mexico, actually, Walter, could you go to the next slide here? Thank you. Um, our border with Mexico also remains open. However, tourism and non-essential travel is not allowed, but uh, goods, workers, and essential travel continues uh, through our southern border. Um, it's also worth noting that the emergency programs uh, at the SBA and at the state level, which I'll get into a little more detail later, are based on where the business is incorporated, uh, not on whether the owner is foreign or uh, American. Uh, and so we're happy to help foreign business owners, including Dutch companies, navigate the various relief programs that may be available to them. Um, and you know, obviously those programs you know, can, can hopefully provide support. Additionally, uh, for those interested in our state trade expansion program, also known as the STEP program, please visit californiaexport.org. Uh, funding is still available through this program to help companies with their export expansion efforts. And if you're interested in learning more, we're happy to connect you to members in our office who administer the program. Um, as evidenced by our participation on this call, we're also in close contact with the state's consular corps. Uh, they have been overall amazing in offering support uh, to us during this COVID pandemic. So I want to give a special shout out to uh, the folks at the Netherlands Consulate who uh, we've been in contact with on a nearly a daily basis as we try to figure out the best way to support uh, Dutch and other foreign businesses. So uh, next slide, please. I want to go over the resources that should be considered primary for businesses in California, including Dutch businesses. So the three links on the screen, which will also be sent out after this call, should be considered your go-to places for information on the latest state and federal programs available for, for businesses. If there are questions or you need help navigating the various programs, please reach out to our team. Next slide, please. In California, we've taken a wide variety of measures to support businesses from both a loan perspective and a tax perspective. From a tax perspective, the first thing we've done is that small and medium-sized enterprises can delay up to $50,000 worth of sales tax payments for up to a year interest-free. This provides companies uh, additional working capital, and the state can also work with individual businesses on payment plans. Additionally, the state has extended the local and state tax filing deadlines by 90 days and will grant a 60-day extension on payroll tax filing and payment by written request. For, for more information on these programs, please visit the link that I included in the uh, slide. And it's also, if you just go to covid19.ca.gov, you can find it that way as well. Um, next slide, please. I wanna talk about a few other programs at the state level to help support businesses. First, uh, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter. So this is our primary way to provide businesses updates once a week on new information to be aware of and any changes in funding or procedures to the current programs. Secondly, uh, GoBiz hosts weekly small business technical assistance webinars. These are put on by the Entrepreneurship Task Force, which is set up to ensure that small businesses and entrepreneurs have resources to support them during this time. Third, at the state level, there are two different disaster loan programs currently running. The first is through the California Infrastructure Bank, excuse me, the California Infrastructure Bank Small Business Finance Center. This program is for companies from one to 750 people and it's a loan guarantee program that guarantees up to 95% of the value of a loan for seven years. So you work with community lenders to get a loan, and then the Small Business Finance Center's loan guarantee program guarantees 95% of the value of that loan. The second program is run through the California Treasurer's Office and is a similar loan guarantee program. 
So this is another instance where you go to a community bank that participates in the program and the California Treasurer's Office will guarantee the small business loan, uh, allowing those community lenders to lend to smaller and also uh, slightly higher risk clients. So for more information on that program, uh, visit the link on the slide as well. So those are the programs that we're running at the state level. Um, obviously the headlines focus a lot on the programs run out of SBA. Um, we can, Actually, is there another slide? Um, I don't remember if I included another slide or not. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, the, there are also programs that are run out of uh, the Small Business Administration at the federal level. Um, GoBiz can help support navigate those programs. And uh, we have small business assistance centers throughout the state who can help all variety of businesses navigate what options are available to them, what the funding levels look like, and even help with the application process. So again, the key links for folks are going to be uh, that covid19.ca.gov that you see in my uh, background here. That's really gonna be the place where you can access all these other services. And please feel free to reach out directly uh, to me if you have any questions, I can make sure you're connected with the right people or uh, reach out directly through those links that have been provided in the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Max. Uh, we will come back later, I'm sure, to some of these uh, points uh, in our Q&A session at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, but um, before I give the floor to uh, Jan with, uh, with a legal uh, overview, um, I would like to say a few words about what's possible and what is, uh, what is offered in, in other states, but also in, in, in San Francisco and in uh, Los Angeles. I will very briefly go over it just to spare some time, but all information will be shared after the, uh, the call. Um, and of course, also your slides, uh, Max, with all your useful links uh, in there. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the overview from California State. Um, uh, you also mentioned, of course, federal. There, there was a federal package agreed, uh, I think that was around 10 days ago, and there's a lot of emphasis there on the small business administration loans, different type of loans, uh, including also the CARES Act uh, for empl employees, employers, small and large companies. On top of that, there's also tax filing uh, and payment delays at federal level, but also at state level. Uh, I will not go deeper into that now, but you, you will find uh, information on that uh, on the on the state, uh, different state uh, websites. Um, and like I said, during this very brief presentation, I will focus on the, or I will list the main measures in the cities of San Francisco and LA, and but also in the states of Colorado, Utah, uh, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington, um, as there are similar measures in, in these different states. Uh, approved. So firstly, um, I would like to go over a more general overview of uh, what, what is offered uh, to, to give a little bit a, 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 an idea what is offered in different states and cities. So the, the main focus, of course, is on financial support, loans and grants. Of course, grants uh, is, a, is a gift loan you have to pay back with, with uh, often a small interest rate. A grant is a gift, so you don't have to uh, return that. And most measures are for small companies and, and ma mainly in, in service related areas uh, who are directly affected uh, by the shutdown and, and are excluded from the essential business uh, list. There's also uh, support measures to, to pay for or partially pay for sick time, uh, or temporary or part-time work reduction. And that's of course also for, for, for small uh, companies. There's also non-financial support offered, uh, for example, consulting, uh, advice, uh, and other services, tool, toolkits, for example. But I will come back to that when I do the brief overview of the cities and the states. And also in certain states, uh, cities have, have taken the, the main initiative, uh, like in, uh, uh, for example, Salt Lake City and in, uh, in Arizona as well, and Oregon. So let's now go to the first slide, uh, Jan.
Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, in San Francisco first, so I stay in California for the moment. In San Francisco, there's there's a there's a lot of uh, of of uh, of offerings for 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 uh, help as well. For example, the Small Business Resiliency Fund is put up, and uh, small businesses one to five employees can apply for a ten thousand uh, uh, loan. Uh, there's a hardship uh, emergency loan program uh, that that will uh, go that will provide loans for up to fifty thousand US dollar uh, to help pay for payroll, rent, and utilities. Uh, we also include uh, the deadlines for these uh, programs as well. I can also imagine that some of them will be extended. Uh, there's also different city loans and grants. Uh, links will be provided to those uh, to those programs. Uh, and uh, like in other cities uh, in San Francisco as well, there's a workers and family first program uh, where the, uh, the city partially pays the additional uh, sick time uh, for uh, employees. There's also layoff alternatives. So uh, for example, um, uh, work share program that, uh, that, that ensures that, that, uh, that the city pays for part, part time uh, lay of uh, unemployment benefits. In uh, Los Angeles, uh, secondly, there, there's a small business emergency microloan program with specific microloans. Um, also city loans and grants up to, uh, up to 10,000 US dollars. Um, also a work share and layoff prevention program to help uh, small companies. There's a, what I just mentioned, a small business toolkit. So this is a non-financial support, which also might be very useful to navigate through this period. And in, in the Los Angeles, there's the mayor's funds, uh, which has identified funds uh, specifically on COVID-19 response and relief. So next slide, please. Yeah, and now we go to some other states. Uh, I, I will not mention all the states. Uh, if you have specific questions on other states we don't mention today, please come to us. But there's quite similar measures in place as well, because most uh, states also offer and administer what Max just said, the small business administration loans, for example, but also very specific ones. But I focus now on uh, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Arizona, and Colorado. So in Washington state, uh, what is offered there, shared work, partial employment, standby programs. So that's all work related support for smaller companies to, to ensure that people don't have to be laid off or get partially paid. Um, there's several support programs to focus on insurance, on, on export as well, and on, and on employees and employers. There's a specific business stabilization fund, uh, which provide grants up to 10,000 US dollars and that's for companies up to four employees. Uh, there's on top of that a working Washington small business emergency grant uh, and that provides companies up to 10 employees, also 10,000 in emergency funding. Then in Oregon, uh, several counties uh, are, are, are quite helpful as well, like Beaverton and Hillsborough who are helping with grants uh, to pay for costs for small businesses as well. There's also a work share program in Oregon uh, and they pro provide also non-financial support uh, with business consulting, planning and counseling. Next slide, please. Um, the final three states I will be focused on. So Colorado uh, has a, a small business emergency relief uh, grant program to up to seven and a half thousand US dollar in grants are provided to uh, specifically particularly affected uh, businesses and they also have a, a work share program and a very specific promo called uh, job attached layoff which means that uh, that if you return to the same company uh, within a certain amount of weeks, I think it's around three months, uh, uh, the, 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 you get a, an unemployment benefit as well. Uh, so the employee in Utah, uh, there is the Utah Small Business Bridge Loan Program. Uh, 11 million is provided there for businesses and nonprofits in these different areas you see. 
And the city of, of Salt Lake City has an emergency loan fund. Uh, and this loan program is specifically for re relief in, in the fields of payroll and rent. And uh, in, in these cases of these, of this unforeseen emergency we are in now. Uh, finally, uh, Arizona. Arizona offers microloans and this is specifically for, for companies in southern uh, Arizona in these specific counties. Um, and uh, additionally, there's a small business success loan program. Uh, that is a, uh, a program that is also from the private sector, so not only government uh, uh, initiative. And there are emergency relief grants um, as well in Arizona. But, uh, but uh, to, uh, to, to, to end here, uh, this is of course a snapshot. Uh, more is available, a lot is uh, happening, a lot is changing as well. So please check the different links and uh, check the resources at state and city level. And we will also be upgrading uh, our information, updating our information obviously. And if you have any questions, please come back to us on our email address and on the WhatsApp, uh, special WhatsApp number we will be providing uh, later on. And, and please also, you can ask your questions as well on the Q&A chat uh, on the bottom of the screen. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor now to Jan, who will talk about uh, legal, legal implications. Jan is partner at uh, Baker and McKenzie in New York. Uh, but of course, very much focused here on the on the U.S. And, uh, and please, please go ahead, Jan. We are very uh, eager to hear about the legal implications of all this. Thank you, uh, Walter. Um, so it looks like I have managed to unmute myself. So uh, thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about legal stuff. That's always everybody's uh, favorite subject. So uh, so bear with me. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to try to cram in. 10 minutes uh, allocated to me a couple of different uh, subject matters uh, that we've got a lot, a lot of questions on so obviously i'm going to go through this very quickly at a high level um, if you have any more questions feel free to reach out through the q a tool my contact information is also on here and my firm has uh, a resource center that is available for free with lots of information on various legal issues so with that, let's get started with uh, contracts on the next slide. Um, and uh, we get a lot of questions whether um, uh, COVID constitutes a force majeure under the contracts that people had. So first question is, what is force majeure? So basically, that's an event beyond the party's control that uh, has the potential to excuse contractual performance if that has become difficult or impossible. And what is the effect? The effect is that you can suspend, defer, or be released from your obligations under the contract without liability. Next slide, please. So what is a typical uh, definition? Uh, so typical definition lists a number of events, be, uh, a number of events, very specific events that are outside of the party's control uh, that make performance impossible. So what events are typically listed? So um, war, terrorist attacks, famine, earthquakes, uh, epidemics, government orders, that sort of stuff. So here we're dealing with a, a pandemic or an epidemic, and we're also dealing with government orders. So for example, if the government tells you to shut down your factory, that uh, you know, is a way to get under this uh, force majeure clause. And sometimes there's some catch-all language that's, that adds at the end of the definition any other event outside of the control of the parties. Tricky thing is that often uh, there's a requirement that you provide notice uh, to your counterparts, so make sure you do that. So on the next slide, what is the starting point? The starting point is really to look at what your contract says. And if you're looking at the contract, look at what the governing law clause says. So this is typically the stuff that only the lawyers get excited about, but this is the time that you will have to look at it as well. So it could provide for the application of Netherlands law, or it could say, well, California law applies, New York law applies, some other state or some other country. But this makes a difference, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, so under Netherlands law, um, you check whether there's a force majeure clause. 
Also take a look at the change of law clause because that may apply as well since the law has changed. So if you have a factory and the law says you have to close the factory, maybe you can uh, uh, find an escape under that provision. There's also, uh, for example, in many mergers, uh, merger and acquisition contracts, which is kind of my bread and butter, uh, often a material adverse effect clause. So that's also a good one to look at. In Dutch contracts, if there's no specific provision, um, there's always the overmacht clause, the statutory force majeure. So this is a provision in the Dutch civil code that applies if you did not put a force majeure clause in your provision. And this is very different from how US law operates because they don't really have that concept. Um, in a US contract, you need to have it in your contract. Also under Dutch law, um, under the civil code, the theory of un unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen omstandigheden, always applies, um, as well as the, the pr general principles of reasonableness and fairness, redelijkheid and billigheid, which is also something you don't really have to the same extent under US law. So on the next slide, quickly going through uh, how force majeure works in the US. So it's a state law issue. So you have to look at Delaware law, New York law, California law, whatever the contract says. In the US, typically courts interpret force majeure provisions narrowly. So you have to really look at what the words say. In California, there's a little extra twist that you have to demonstrate that you used sufficient or reasonable efforts to avoid the consequences of the force majeure. Uh, so, for example, source trying to source uh, the goods from, from a different uh, supplier. If the contract is silent, the civil code doesn't really come and help you like it would in the Netherlands with the overmacht uh, uh, provision. Moving on to the next slide. So, if the force majeure is not going to help you, there's some other theories under US law that you may want to look at. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. You know, we can cover this in more detail, but not uh, in, in this webinar. So there's the theory of impossibility of performance. In California, uh, there's the theory of impracticability of performance. And there's the theory of frustration of purpose. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, if your contract involves the sale of goods, this is something that people often overlook. Also look at the United Nations Convention of Contracts for the, sale, uh, for the International Sale of Goods, because that may also contain an escape uh, clause here. And in M&A provisions, uh, sorry, in M&A contracts, there's often a uh, material adverse effect out. So what does this mean on the next slide for you? most important piece of advice that i can give you is speak with your customers and suppliers try to work out a solution because uh, just suing you is not going to solve their problems because many of the courts are closed and they still won't have their products and similarly if you sue your your supplier that's not gonna, gonna help you that much either but if you have to look at the contract analyze the contract very carefully because they're not created equally uh, the words really matter here as I mentioned before, there could be notice requirements, so meet those. Uh, there's a pitfall that if you, on the, if you are on the receiving end of one of these force majeure um, uh, notices, uh, if it's for the sale of goods, you have to respond within 30 days or otherwise you're out of, look, uh, out of luck. Next piece of advice is to carefully document your force majeure events. Write down so that you don't forget what the problem was, how you tried to resolve it, and why it was possible or impossible to perform under the contract. Next slide, please. Um, next thing is to, to do is, you know, the COVID-19 is not done yet. So, so prepare to plan and document your plans for the future so that um, uh, you can show that you, did, you tried the best you could. We are in the US. Uh, this is a litigious society, so be prepared for litigation, much more so than in the Netherlands, you know, where the culture is much more to uh, try to resolve things amicably. In the US, it often ends up in litigation. So this means that, you know, you have to kind of think ahead of what you uh, tell people, what your internal communications are, because they're all subject to uh, discovery in uh, a US legal proceed proceeding.
know your local rule rules um, and be consistent. So you cannot claim force majeure under one contract and then under another contract just perform as if there's no problem because this is all going to come out. Next slide, please. Um, don't be too pessimistic. This situation also creates opportunities. We're using Zoom right now. They're doing great. Uh, think about how great Amazon is doing. So there are opportunities. There are also going to be a lot of opportunities in the M&A field uh, because basically your competitor is going to might be for sale uh, sometime soon at a low price. So think about this. Uh, you know, once things quiet down a bit, you, you know, you should. Uh, perhaps become active as an acquirer. Uh, be careful when you draft new contracts. So we recently uh, assisted a Dutch company that had certain very high tech equipment that they were going to install in the US. So this is a very typical situation because there's a lot of high tech stuff in the Netherlands and there's demand for those products in the Netherlands. Often technicians from the Netherlands are flown in to install those products. So what we did in that particular contract, we changed the uh, force mature clause and said, if the US government is not going to be issuing visas for our technicians to come to the US, we're, we don't have to perform under the contract. Think it through. Uh, US law is very complex. So one of the suggestions that one of our client, clients had was, you know, we're going to lay off our local staff and keep our Dutch expats. So that's a problem because that is basically discrimination based on national origin, uh, which you could, could get sued for. Also, putting your Dutch expats on a lower salary could create immigration issues because if you have told the government that you're going to employ, that you are going to employ a particular Dutch executive in the US at a particular salary, and then you change that salary, that could be a problem. Next slide, please. Um, so I have two slides on employment law. I'm just going to focus on the things that are different, really different in the US. So the big difference between the Netherlands and the US is that in the US we have employment at will, which means that you, know, you can basically fire anybody at any point in time. But be very careful because you cannot do it for an unlawful reason. So you cannot be discriminating, for example, on the basis of national origin. You cannot be retaliating uh, illegally. Um, if you entered into a contract with an employee, you have to comp uh, comply with the terms of that contract. So we had a client recently who said, well, you know, there's this very difficult economic situation. Can we lay off these employees? And we said, well, you have to look at the contract. If the contract says that you, have, you were going to pay two months severance, that's what you have to do. Um, unionized employees are a different story. If you're going to do a mass layoff, think about the WARN Act. I'm not going to go into that, but just put it on your radar screen. And if you are going to pay somebody severance, make sure you get a written release from them, releasing you from, for example, any discrimination claims. Next slide, please. Another option for employees, uh, for employers in the US is to furlough their employees. It's not something that's known in the Netherlands, so that's why I'm mentioning it. So basically, this is where you lay people off, but they stay on your payroll. You're not paying them, but uh, they can continue to be covered generally uh, by your healthcare insurance. And the plan is you know, that they're furloughed for a month or two months or three months, and that you will then, uh, and afterwards, you will uh, rehire them. There's some working from home issues. If you have non-exempt, so that's hourly employees that you pay on an hourly basis, make sure that there's a mechanism to track their work hours because otherwise, you know, when this is all said and done, they'll come back to you and say, oh, instead of 40 hours, I worked 60 hours. So, so you gotta uh, pay me for those extra hours. Two slides on immigration law. So I'm not an immigration specialist. My uh, colleague, Matt Gorman, will be available during the Q&A to answer uh, uh, immigration law related questions, but this is very important for Dutch companies. Uh, the travel uh, restrictions, just one slide back, please. Um, uh, you know, make it very so back, please. I'm sorry. Yes, here we go. So, so um, US citizens and green card holders can still travel into the US, and so can their spouses. 
There are some visas on which you can enter, still enter the US, but most visas that are relevant for Dutch business people that travel in and out of the US all the time, for example, uh, the uh, E visa, an H1 visa, or an I visa, or the visa waiver program, what people call the ESTA program, they're not available to enter the US. So that's a problem. Next slide, please. Then this is my last slide for those who are keeping track of time. So expect delays with all immigration related stuff. The US Consulate General in Amsterdam has basically suspended all routine services. So no new visa applications, no visa renewals. Um, and uh, so basically the only way to go is through DHS, but they have uh, suspended their premium processing um, and they've suspended all in-person uh, appointments. So it's a tough situation. Um, sometimes, you know, if you contact them, you can get an emergency appointment, um, but we're in a tough spot. Um, uh, and that's unfortunately the message that I have for you. Uh, and with that, I'd give, like to give the floor back to uh, Walter for the next presenter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. We will come back to uh, some of these questions, of course, later during your Q&A. But I'm very happy we also have an entrepreneur uh, among us uh, today, and uh, Arjan de Raaf. And he will talk, uh, he's, he's the founder and CEO of Edenry. And he will talk more about the implications uh, of the, the COVID-19 crisis for his uh, business. And he also will provide a, a look ahead. Um, so please, Arjan, uh, please go ahead. I see your first slide already there. So uh, glad to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you for having us on this webinar. So yeah, a little bit about our company. We uh, provide contact data enrichment, content enrichment, and editorial enrichment. Uh, we have a small team of seven people across California, the Netherlands, and Asia. Uh, actually, I was in Asia for a, for a month uh, preparing for our launch uh, in March when Trump declared a national emergency. So I changed my flight back and went back to America the day after. So yeah, as for the business, step by step, uh, some of our first clients that put uh, the ongoing integration on hold, including one of uh, the major sports leagues here in America, which was the biggest hit for our company, of course. So we somehow had to rethink our strategy, especially uh, because we were planning uh, to launch. Um, the good thing was that we are a 100% remote company, so working from home was nothing new for our team. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, everything is on hold right now. Uh, for companies, their priority, of course, is their own people and how they can survive COVID-19 now and in the future. Um, some pieces of advice that I can give what we have learned so far is it's very important to talk to your team. This is, these are not only hard times for your company, but also for your team and employees. Uh, keep them safe uh, is the most important message, I think. I think it's also a good time now to take uh, time to reflect on your strengths and weaknesses. Um, People expect a second wave, uh, maybe a third wave. So I think we have we, to be prepared for that. So it's better to think now and uh, learn how we can act later uh, because it might come back. We might shut down everything again, who knows? So um, the other thing is also, I think it's very important to remain visible to your clients, uh, keep communicating with them by maybe sending out a weekly newsletter, updates or changes to your strategy or product range. And who knows, they might need your services now maybe more than ever. Uh, for example, next slide, please, by the way. For example, we realized that one of our ideas for the future to provide audience-based, conversation-based, and location-based lead generation is something companies read need right now or after the COVID-19. So we are actually now working around the clock to have uh, that up and running uh, very soon so we can bring that to the market in, uh, uh, in May. So. Yeah, we are all facing unexpected challenges right now, so and nobody can predict the future. So, um, uh, especially the impact of uh, the whole COVID-19 on, uh, yeah, the, the companies and the people. So, uh, yeah, that's what we experienced so far. Um, yeah, that's it for now. And I only like say to people, uh, thank you for your time and stay safe. And it will get better. Thank you very much, uh, Arjan. Uh, very, very helpful. It's, it's clear that it's affecting everybody, but um, you're right. Maybe for some online companies, there, there is still some, uh, some silver lining, as you Absolutely. mentioned by Jan a moment ago. Um, 
yeah, I would like to, to open the floor now to uh, to 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 question. We got some questions in uh, earlier, and I just see some. So I maybe maybe first uh, to keep with uh, the, the, the timeline as well. Maybe first two questions for 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 Max. Um, there has been a question on on the the paycheck uh, protection uh, program. I, I, I believe you also looked looked into that uh, as well, and and the, and the eligibility for specifically for Dutch companies or for non non US companies, and then uh, secondly, maybe more a general uh, question: What about eligibility for all these different programs uh, for non US companies? But maybe let's focus first on the Paycheck Protection Program because there's a lot of interest in that. Yeah, so uh, the PPP is uh, run federally. So the state, the support that we give is to California businesses who are trying to navigate that program. We can help there. Uh, with regards to eligibility, foreign companies who are incorporated, foreign company, companies incorporated in California that have foreign ownership, let's put it like that, they are eligible to apply. Uh, there is no disqualifying question on any of the programs about whether your company is foreign owned or not. So if you are uh, a Dutch citizen with a California uh, incorporated company, you are absolutely eligible to apply. Um, if that's a little confusing, because it might be, uh, there's a bunch of small business assistance centers throughout California. Um, and if you go to business.ca.gov slash centers, you can find your closest center and they can help walk you through that entire process of applying to programs, both at the state level and at the federal level. And, you know, one of the biggest things that we've been hearing from small businesses across the state is kind of a bit of confusion about what program is right for me. What do I qualify for? you know, given my specific circumstance, what should I do? Uh, these small business assistance centers are a great place to go to get that question specifically answered. And at the state level, uh, I put my email address in the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if we can be helpful. We have a small business uh, team within GoBiz as well that's trying to provide support. So I'd be happy to connect you with them too. Thanks very much, uh, Max. And uh, it speaks for itself, of course, that, that we also have contacts in in other states, uh, basically the counterparts of Max in in in, uh, in Washington State, and Oregon, and, and the other states I mentioned in our uh, our region. Uh, so we will be happy to link you as well there and to provide you with more details on on on, on the situation in the, in other states. So, but thanks very much, Max. I, I would I would like now to to uh, head to uh, to to Jan and to Matt. We, we, we got some questions on uh, the situation of furloughs. Uh, so that's, like you said, something that we're not used to in the Netherlands. So that is specifically uh, something for the US. So one would be, can you confirm that employees that are furloughed, they can apply for unemployment benefits in the US or permanent resident, for permanent resident holders or citizens only? Yeah, this is Jan. So I'm not sure, I'm not a specialist in unemployment benefits, so I don't think I can, can answer that question. I think the rule is that you have to be able to work. Uh, the problem is that, you know, depending on what your exact visa situation is, you know, typically you get a visa to work at a particular company. So I think it's problematic if, if, if uh, um, you know, you would try to work for another, for another company. But again, I'm not a specialist in this area, so I can get back to the person who, who asked the question with the, uh, um, uh, with the right answer once I've spoken to one of our specialists. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's the, uh, there's another question of furloughs as well, uh, but we will, uh, we will uh, get them to you and then uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we will work on that offline. Yeah, I think Matt may have some input on that. Okay, Matt? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And hi, everybody. I'm Matt Gorman. I'm an associate attorney at Baker McKenzie. I work with Jan um, all the time, but I, I specialize in, in immigration. So, um, immigration, US immigration law does not really recognize the idea of a furlough. In other words, if you are here on a temporary work visa, your E, your L visa, your H 1B, um, part of maintaining your valid visa status is continuing your employment as it's been described to the government. 
Jan alluded to this earlier. So if you are furloughed or you're, you're temporarily not receiving pay and not working, then technically, um, in most situations, your, your visa is no longer valid. Now, the U.S. immigration law does contemplate sort of this, this occurring. And in this circumstance, most visa types have a 60-day grace period. Um, so it's going to depend on the specific visa type, but most fall into a 60-day grace period. During this 60-day period, um, the individual on the visa who's no longer employed can seek to change their visa to another work visa. Let's say there's another employer who can sponsor them. Um, they can stay here for the 60-day period to sort of gather their belongings and leave. Um, and, and there's also sort of a, a, a sub-question here. If you're in this circumstance and your normal course of action would be to return to your home country, uh, but you cannot um, you know, because of travel restrictions, or whatever the case may be due to COVID. Um, if you're on a work visa, for example, you could request a change of status to that of a visitor um, with the USCIS. So that would be a paper application to the US government, essentially saying, I was here on a work visa, I'm in my 60 day grace period, um, I need to remain as a visitor for six months, and you could submit that application. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Matt. Maybe another very specific question. I don't think it was completely arrest now. So if you furlough foreign workers, they are required to leave the, uh, the US if they are not a green card holder. holder uh, or is the 30 day grace period extended due to limited travel? Yeah, so again, if you're, it's going to depend a little bit on the particular visa type. But if you are here on a work visa um, and you're furloughed, uh, you will, chances are, it is likely you will be able to take advantage of that 60 day period to remain physically here. During that time, you can seek to change your status. And if all else fails, for the most part, um, uh, other than folks who came here on an ESTA, um, if you're on a work visa uh, or even here on a visitor visa, you can request during that 60 day period uh, to remain in the United States as a visitor. Now, of course, once you're a visitor, you cannot work in that status, but it would provide a basis for you to physically remain in the United States as well as your family members um, until you such time that you're, you're able to return to your home country. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. I would also like to maybe uh, ask the, uh, the participants of today's webinar if somebody has experience as a Dutch company uh, with uh, with uh, using uh, or taking advantage of any of the uh, measures offered in the US uh, and would like to share that experience, that would also be great. So we're not op open for questions, but we're op also open to share experiences because it might help others as well. Then uh, maybe some other questions for, for Jan and, and Matt. Um, so mo more a general visa question. Uh, are federal and state measures bound to specific types of visa for foreign entrepreneurs? So in other words, does the type of visa impact eligibility? Sure, so I'm happy to, to answer that. So I think big picture, um, the type, the, the, nothing about the immigration law has, has changed from a statutory or a regulatory point of view. Um, so really what we're seeing here, just broadly speaking, are the travel restrictions, the shutdown of the consulates and the embassies um, for, for visa processing, and essentially a, a significant slowdown of immigration applications being processed within the United States with the Department of Homeland Security. So there's no uh, immigration provision or change in the law specific to entrepreneurs and, and those uh, related visa types um, that would uh, prohibit anybody from eligibility for uh, getting a new visa type, the more practical problem is, um, A, because the consulates and embassies are shut down for those visa types, um, including a number of entrepreneur visas that one would typically apply directly um, at a U.S. consulate or embassy abroad. That's just not an option until the consulate reopens and we just don't know when that's going to be. Um, and it, for applications filed with USCIS, with the U.S. government, um, the majority of those applications historically could be filed under what's called premium processing, which means that the company pays extra money to the government and they get a decision within 15 days. Because the USCIS has suspended that program, the average processing time for a visa application is going to be closer to three and a half to five and a half, six and a half months. Um, and, and so basically there's no, to answer the specific question, there's no change in the law with regards to entrepreneurial visas. Um, but I think on the more practical level, 
Um, things are just going to move much more slowly now. If this is an extension of one of those visa types, you may consider applying for that extension with the USCIS um, in the interim here. Again, it's gonna take a while, but it does provide an option. And if this is an initial visa or a visa in the first instance, you know, my suggestion certainly would be get as much done as you can now in terms of preparation, um, but understand that there's likely going to be significant delays in, in the issuance of any new visas. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Maybe another general uh, visa related questions. I'm, I'm still in the US, but fear that I might be overstaying my visa given the limited options to travel home. What are the consequences and what can I do? Yeah, really, really good question. And sort of touches on what I, I mentioned earlier, but I do want to expand on that a little bit. Um, so uh, first of all, if you're here on a work visa and um, you know, your H, your E, your L, uh, your I, and the terms of your employment have changed such that you're, you're no longer working as was described and, and you don't have employment right now. Um, most visas, um, not the I visa, but most visas have a 60 day grace period. Uh, so again, you can seek to change to a different visa type if, if one is available, um, including potentially just a visitor visa to allow you to remain here in the short term. Um, uh, you may also seek to transfer your visa to another employer. For example, if you're on an H-1B, you might be able to find another employer who's willing to sponsor you during that period. The one exception to the sort of change of status and grace period is for folks who entered under the Visa Waiver Program or ESTA. So what the general rule under the immigration law is that any individual entry under the ESTA program can be no longer than 90 days. Um, and uh, the immigration law is very specific that the ESTA, unlike visa entries, uh, the ESTA does not provide a means to, as a general rule, extend your stay or change your status. So if you've entered under the, the ESTA program and you're feeling like you're stuck here because you can't go home, your options are going to be much more limited. Um, I would absolutely suggest that you seek uh, immigration counsel to see if you know, the facts of your particular case would merit any alternative strategies. One option that does exist is something called a satisfactory departure. Um, under this scenario, if you've entered under an ESTA, in the normal course, you could ask the US government to extend your stay another 30 days. So that makes that entry valid for up to 120 days. Now, the normal mechanism to request this is an in-person appointment at the USCIS office, which is impossible right now. So my understanding is that the, the best mechanism to do this now is with the CBP, which is the border officers and the officers who are at most likely the airport at which you enter the United States. So you may be able to visit their deferred inspection office or send their office an email to see if you can get those additional 30 days. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Matt. I think there was one clarification on the uh, questions for economic measures uh, for our foreign owned companies uh, eligible. So according to Matt, Max, of course, but uh, um, the question was so Dutch firms that have American employees in the US on payroll. So I think that is that is a yes because you have, that you have to be incorporated in California when you have employees here. Well and if if you for the federal programs like PPP, obviously it's incorporated in the United States. For this yeah. California state specific programs, it's incorporated in California. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thanks for the clarification, uh, Max. Um, so Max, just so that I understand, this is Jan Joosten. So if I think there are often situations where a California-based company incorporates itself in Delaware, but really does all their business in California, would they be eligible for the programs or, or not? So my understanding is that uh, if you're doing business in California, you have to additionally reincorporate in California and then of course pay kind of state sales tax and all those other taxes on the business that you do within the state. Um, if that's the case, you can apply for those programs. If you're a Delaware company only doing business in Delaware, I, I don't think you can apply for the California programs. Right, so I think the technical term is that if you're incorporated in Delaware and you qualify as a foreign corporation in California and register as such, sounds like then you would also be eligible for the for the program yeah the 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 key here is that on all of the applications for the california state program they don't specifically ask about foreign ownership and so if you are doing business in california uh you are eligible to at least apply 
Um, those more complex questions around very specific instances, uh, our small business assistance centers can really help figure out uh, whether each individual specific case, you know, will be eligible for approval in those programs. Great, thank you. I think we have reached the uh, end of our, our webinar, unless there's any questions still from the uh, different participants or the speakers. So I think it was very enlightening. Uh, I would uh, Walter, like thank, uh, I'm oh, seeing one more question ahead. in the I'm seeing one more question in the Q and A um, that I think is relevant to you. Okay. Okay, I see here. So could we get some idea how the uh, Dutch government might be catalyzing return uh, of bilateral trades uh, and supporting new opportunities? Uh, an overview. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we will cover this uh, later on as well. This is not a once-off uh, event, of course. We will be focusing on other topics, but also on uh, on COVID mitigation as well going forward. And, and please, you can also uh, provide your specific questions to us on the WhatsApp number you see or on our uh, uh, email address as well. We have provided to the uh, to to the participants. So uh, if we will we will be coming that uh, coming back on these uh, on this question as well. So please, I would like to uh, to close the uh, the, the webinar. Uh, I would first like to thank um, Max for his uh, contribution from the perspective of uh, the state of California. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, willingness to be here for your time and and for the information links you have shared. We will of course forward them to the uh, participants. I would also like uh, to thank uh, Governor Gavin Newsom for his leadership uh, during these difficult times. I think it's very important to mention that as well. Um, uh, secondly, I would like to thank Jan for his uh, and, and his colleague Matt, of course, for their expertise input, uh, very valuable uh, during these times as well. And I'm sure people can al al always uh, come back to, uh, to them as well if they have uh, more questions. And, uh, and also Aryan with his business perspectives. And I'm sure Aryan, are you are happy that we share your, your, your contact details as well with the participants so that they, uh, they can ask you maybe any follow-up questions uh, and, and, and get your expertise. So hereby, I would like to uh, close the webinar. Uh, we will be coming back in the future with, with follow-on uh, activities. Uh, to help you further, I would like to repeat again that if you have any questions, please contact us on the email, but also on our new WhatsApp number uh, that is open all the time uh, for any questions you might have, not only business related questions, but also other questions you might have as a Dutch citizen here in the US or coming to the US. So thank you very much for your participation and uh, hope to uh, see you very soon. Thanks a lot.